welcome. Welcome. Aloha, everyone. Welcome to Talk Story with John Waihe'e. And have we got a show for you today. Today, we're going to jump the gun. Yeah, I'm fortunate enough to have all the leading pundits of the political scene in the state of Hawaii with us before any other news outlet has their attention. So you're going to see them tomorrow night uh, on the various uh, television channels and other uh, sources of information. But they're going to be with us tonight. And um, I'm going to try and push the envelope as far as I can. We are going to, uh, well, the word is uh, predict, but uh, pro prognosticate. I like that word better. It's prognosticate, pontificate, and prognosticate what the election's results may be. So here we are, topic of discussion, what's going to happen tomorrow night and as a result of tomorrow night, uh, possibly in, in the future. So we have with us today, Chad Blair, who has become very famous uh, for being an editor of Civil Beat one of the true newspapers left in, news sources left in Hawaii. And we have with us Colin Moore, who uh, heads the, um, what's I keep forgetting, the Policy Studies. Policy Center, yeah. Policy Center at the University of Hawaii, where they are turning young minds into activists. And someday his <laughs> students maybe occupying his office. You, you never know what happens at the <laughs> University of Hawaii, but we have him here today. I have also an old longtime friend, my former communications director, also is worked with uh, the mayor of the, he, uh, I guess uh, when, with uh, Kurt Codwell, when he was in the legislature and helped him communicate, he needs your help. Chuck, he needs your help. Help him communicate with the people, with his constituents. And also uh, Senator Brian Schatz, who learned a lot from Chuck. So I don't know if I can find a better panel than the three of you today. So, let, you know, let's get started with the easy stuff first. Who's going to win the mayor's race tomorrow? That's the first question. Uh, who, uh, who wants to take a crack at that? All right, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it. I thought it would come from the right. I just suspected. Oh, no, no, <laughs> that's. Uh, and, and speaking of the right, I hope we got it right. But both the Civil Beat and the Honolulu Star Advertiser say it's not a close race. We have both of us, Rick Blangiardi, former general manager at Hawaii News Now, former football gridiron star, winning fairly handily over Keith Amamiya, uh, the business executive, uh, high school sports leader. Um, I don't see that changing dramatically. There still was a lot of undecided in both of those polls, but uh, at least in our poll, I can tell you that, and actually I think the star advertiser too, Rick Blangiardi was winning across nearly every single demographic, old, young, educated, less so, with money, without gender, uh, the only area where Keith Amamiya had a clear edge uh, was among Democrats and liberals. And who knows? We'll see if that turns them out. As you know, Keith was running on, I'm a Democrat, even though it's a nonpartisan race. So I'll go out on the limb and, and predict that our next mayor will be Rick Blangiardi. I, I agree with, uh, with Chad that Blangiardi will probably win, but there was a little bit of a an October surprise in, in this race, which, which Chad was actually involved in because he asked Rick Blangiardi this question directly, did you vote for Donald Trump in 2016? And, and Blangiardi answered honestly, yes. Um, and Amamiya has made um, quite a bit out of that in campaign ads. I mean, some campaign ads, really, that's, that's mainly what it is, just Rick Blangiardi. Well, uh, uh, Chad, did you, you, did you ask him also whether he intends to vote for um, Trump again? No, he indicated that that would not be the case. I don't remember if he was explicitly saying Biden Harris, but he made clear that he regretted uh, his vote for Donald Trump. Uh, he made it clear he didn't vote for Hillary Clinton four years ago. Now, Keith Amamiya, his campaign didn't mention that part about disavowing that vote, but 
Rick Blangiardi sounded like, a, I think, a lot of people uh, four years later regretting what they did, thought it was going to turn out differently and turn out to be much worse than expected. By the way, I received no commission from the Amamea campaign for asking that question. <laughs> That's all right. Just it was a freebie, though. You know, it was a freebie for them. Yeah. And, and it, I, I'm sure they, they, they I'm sure they appreciate it. Well, what do you uh, think, Chuck? Um, you think uh, pretty much. Well, let me ask you another question, Chuck. If uh, I'm assuming that uh, uh, there's going to be uh, a pretty fierce election on the national level. So do you think that this whole issue with Biden and Trump is going to affect any of the downstream races like the Amamiya campaign obviously uh, wanted it to do? I think in Hawaii, no, not really. I think across the country, it's it's beyond uh, it's beyond our imagination just what the down tickets will, will what the implication of all that will be. But it'll be heavy uh, and meaningful historically to the country and to Hawaii because the decision making that goes on in Washington affects us so much. Well, you know, just uh, I'm, I'm going to use that to step into other races locally so we can do it. We're, I'm. I'm thinking that it may have an impact, maybe not on the mayoral race, where people may have their own way of choosing who they see as a leader. And, and it's not necessarily to do with uh, their stands on, on, on a particular policy, but uh, more, more, more than that. But I was wondering whether or not the um, Trump-Biden race on the national level will affect some of the House races where we have a limited number of Republicans now running. Have you, uh, what's your feeling on that? Governor, the larger question to me is, I, I, I don't think there's a, a strong Republican representation in our races now. And, and, and not like years ago when there, there seemed to be more able Republicans uh, from Scotchy Henderson to Pat Psyche, you name it. Um, the pickings are slim. The question is, after this election, in, in whatever way the Republican Party rebuilds itself nationally, will there be a, an avenue for local Republicans to become more viable? And even as an active Democrat, the answer for me is I hope so, because a, a legitimate Republican, not a, a, a Trumpian Republican Party, but a legitimate Republican uh, GOP Hawaii style used to be important and should be tomorrow. Yeah, well, Colin, you know, one of the more interesting races is the comeback of Sam Sloan in, yeah. the, uh, in Hawaii Kai, and he's running against Stanley Chang. And S Sam has made no, um, Yes, he's never tried to hide the fact that he is a conservative Republican. I don't know if he's a Trump Republican. Uh, what, I can, what I'm curious about, and this kind of goes back to your previous question, is in these somewhat more conservative districts that have elected Republicans in the past, like Hawaii Kai, are, is there going to be this, because of, of a big outpouring of support for Trump, even here, just from general enthusiasm, are there going to be more Republicans voting than, than normally would in that in that race. Um, you know, there's another one that that looks a little bit like this, which actually could be a loss for the Republicans in the House, which is the House District 50 race, which is Cynthia mm -hmm. Thielen's seat right now. Uh, they're running they're running a really competitive candidate there, uh, Kanani Souza, who is a lawyer, um, really well respected in the community against Patrick Bronco, who's a good Democrat. Don't get me wrong, but. Um, you know, they it's interesting to me that the Republicans in some of the down ticket legislative races have some really strong candidates, but then they weren't able to field a legitimate candidate, um, for example, for the CD1 district running against Ed Case. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that I, maybe I wasn't surprised, but I thought that was sort of interesting. But I think that would be another one, this District 50 race, like the, the Stanley Chang, um, Sam Sloan race. Um, where, what uh, about the uh, what about the Mililani race where uh, you have uh, uh, Tishla chick running against Kelly? Or that's uh, you're you're thinking of a Val Okimoto, right? Yeah, Val Okimoto. Yeah, that's going to be an interesting one because she's only a first termer. Um, I 
I suspect she's going to win re-election. She has a lot of endorsements. Um, you know, she she seems to be a real moderate. Um, you know, the one there there's the other one, which is the um, the only Senate seat the Republicans have right now, right? Which is Kurt Favela's seat. Um, and uh, Rita Cabanella was the House rep there. I, I I don't have a good read on that. Maybe Chad or, or Chuck does. I. I think yeah, Chad. Like what do what do you up, think? Uh, what do you think of that race? So have you given any thought to it? Well, Rita is back in the house. Remember, she lost to Matt Lepresti a while ago. It's kind of incestuous. Matt Lepresti <laughs> ran against yeah, yeah it's, it sure ran is. against ran against Favela two years ago, and of course that was the case. That was the uh, one of the races. Well, it was marked by Matt Lepresti taking someone's flyer down from a house. Remember that it was caught on tape and. Yeah, to apologize. And then that was one of the closer races, but there was no recount between Favela and Lepresti, unlike uh, Tommy Waters and uh, Trevor Ozawa. So um, I th and now you have Matt Lepresti running to get his old seat back that Rita is vacating. I think Favela is nervous. Um, I don't think the president is as popular, uh, but remember about 28 to 30 percent of the vote in Hawaii, at least the last couple of elections, has gone for President Trump, gone a Republican. Let me just say something about Sloan and, and, and Shang. Remember, Sam Sloan, in a lot of ways, really more libertarian than he is Republican. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that has been, you know, it's a, a different value, even though he has run as a Republican. But he has worked cooperatively with uh, the other side of the aisle, and he's actually signed on to a lot of legislation. It's interesting, Stanley Chang actually promoted the fact Here's a guy running for state senate that he got Elizabeth Warren to endorse him, and he got Pete Buttigieg Edge to endorse him, and I, I think even Andrew Yang, if I'm not mistaken. So why does a guy running for state senate in Hawaii Kai need to have three prominent Democrats endorse him? Well, I think he's a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. Okay, let's move on. You know, one of the interesting things about this election is the fact that uh, uh, Kai Kaheli going basically walking through the congressional seat. No opposition. And, uh, you know, that, that says something about the opposition. I mean, that, as uh, you, you said, Chuck, in, in yeah, that, yeah. Joe, Joe Oh, go ahead, Cole. Oh, no, go. I was going to say, Joe Acana is not a bad candidate on paper. Um, I don't think he's going to be oh. competitive. But you, when you look at the amount of money they raised, I think Kai raised more than a million dollars for this race. And I think Acana raised about 35,000 or something. So it's really not, not even. Yeah, you know, it's, it's surprising. It's surprising that uh, when you're in politics and, and speaking from experience, <laughs> when you look like you're going to win anyway, you got a lot of money. People want to make a donation to you. When you look like you're in a tough race, it's a little tougher to get people to contribute. And, and you feel sorry for somebody that's in that situation, you know. I, I, I do anyway. Um, We'll go, we'll go quickly over to the, uh, I, I guess, any other interesting races? The mayor's race on Big Island seems to be pretty settled. Uh, but Chuck, Chuck, you know, I think I think it's somewhat as a, as a former <laughs> Big Islander, uh, you know, they Big Island folks have a way of once every 10 to 15 years just deciding to get out the old broom and sweep, you know, and <laughs> They do it, you know, and, and they, they, they have, there have been lots of surprises. I just asked Dante Carpenter, who, won, who lost this mayorship uh, in a flash. So I, I think that the, the two very, very different kinds of candidates, that is an island that has a lot of big problems, uh, much as I love it. Uh, and we could talk about it for a long time, but just just the, the the emergencies that they've gone through, the problems they're really having with COVID now, uh, their revenue stream as a county. I I, I don't I don't think that's a settled race. It's well, I I tell you, um, we we so so we are going to be looking forward to that tomorrow. You want to make a prediction? I mean, I I just like to encourage predictions, just so you know. You, me personally, no. Maybe, maybe one of the real pundits. <laughs> if, if okay, if, I'll make a prediction. I think I think it's probably going to go to Mitch Roth. Although Akaika Marzo is a really competitive candidate. Um, you know, they they actually agree on a lot of things. And compared to the Honolulu race, which was 
pretty nasty. It was this was a very friendly race, as far as I can understand. They they were joking with each other. I mean, one of the big differences, interestingly enough, in that race is something that uh, actually doesn't even fall necessarily under the control of the county, which is the TMT. And, and Marzo and Roth are split on that, but they're not. There's not big differences really, um, other than that. So I think. Um, you know, it'll probably come down to turnout and, and it could go either way there, too. I mean, if we get a lot of new voters, which we know we have from turnout, those might be a Kaika Marzo voters. I mean, people who are less less establishment. But I still think if you look at the money raised and, and you kind of wonder who, where the Harry Kim vote's going to go, um, it's probably going to go to Roth. Yeah. Well, um, OK, let me move real quickly and go through the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Anything interesting? happening there. You think the incumbents are going to still prevail? We got, um, you know, Colette Machado, who is the current chair, and she's up against uh, Luana Pana, I guess. Alapa. 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 And I, I, sorry for correcting you, but I had to learn the name myself, Governor, and I did end up interviewing her as well as Colette uh, and others. I think what's so fascinating about this race is I think Colette Machado's a little nervous right now. She did not do terribly well in the primary. Mind you, a lot of people leave OHA votes blank, right? We know that. That's been a historic problem, even though everyone in the state can vote for all the OHA races. But Colette Machado, for the first time since ever being in OHA, 1996, she bought TV advertising. That, that shows you that she's worried. And uh, Luana Alapa, who's a I think a former Miss Hawaii, she's an event planner now, has a charismatic presence and, and has got some TV ads up there as well. And let me just say this about Kali Akina, another incumbent. Um, he has run TV commercials in the past, but it took him a while to get elected, remember? He, uh, and then he's finally in, but he's worried because he's running against um, Keone Souza, uh, who I think is a as a real estate agent, if I'm not mistaken, I'm actually going to have to. Pretty much, that. he is a real estate. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, in and real estate got, business. He's got labor endorsement. He got yeah. he's got HGEA behind him, and 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 Akina, as you know, has been a major critic of OHA, even as he sits on the board. And then that other seat is wide open. That's another seat that's pretty amazing. I finally learned how to pronounce his last name, Monakia Manguel. Uh, it was a difficult name for me to get, but I got it down. Talk about TMT. A, a very big critic of, of the Telescope Project. And he's up against uh, Keola Lindsay, who's Bob Lindsay's nephew. And, and Bob Lindsay, of course, is vacating that Big Island seat. So I think all three are very interesting in the fact that three of those candidates are spending money statewide to try and get those votes is telling to me. That, that's very, very interesting. Real quick before we leave Hawaii, uh, I got a question that popped up on the chat box. And I don't know whether it's a question we should take on for this um, for this particular session, but ah, why not? Any anybody on the horizon out there in the in in the political scene that looks like a uh, candidate, possible candidate for governor in two years, besides the uh, you know I guess the obvious the mayor and the lieutenant governor. Any, any does either one of you? Have either one of you come across anybody? Well, there, so, any of you. So obviously, Josh Green is pretty. Josh Green and Kirk Caldwell, but um, I would say Derek Kawakami, the mayor of Kauai, too, might make a run. He's the other name I've heard. Um, that's the only other credible candidate I've I've heard so far. Um, but Chad probably has heard. Heard some others. Well, I think I think Derek would be crazy to leave Kauai, uh, but but he, <laughs> he's the one politician really that's come out smelling good uh, uh, out of the COVID crisis. I, I, I think everybody can agree uh, his actions were firm. He, uh, he had that TikTok video. He did some other things. But you know this, Governor, uh, the only neighbor island mayor to ever, and correct me if I'm wrong, whoever got elected mm -hmm. governor was Linda Lingle, and she lost the first time around. Uh, and yeah. then go the second time, but it's very, very tough. Chuck, I know you know this history probably better than anybody. Really tough for a neighbor island, particularly a small island like Kauai. But in terms of future stars, he's got something about him, some integrity. And I like Colin, I'm having troubles deciding who else, but you know what? Two white guys that we're seeing in the news all the time right now 
I think people are going to be hungry. I say that as a white guy. Uh, I think they're going to be hungry for, for a female candidate, for a, a person of color. Uh, so that's still two years away, which is a lifetime and a lifetime. In politics. Yeah, in exactly. politics. <laughs> well, okay. So that wraps up Hawaii. Chuck, you got anything to add up on? No, on just that? that I think Derek is, is a, Kawakami is, is a, a good candidate, but he's going to have to make up his mind that he really wants to do it. And I think there's some ambivalence there about whether he wants to leave Kauai and want, with a young family and wants to go through all that Chad just described as the as the steeplechase uh, in order to to become a uh, governor from uh, from a neighbor island. It's it's, uh, it's a lot of work. So let's get to tomorrow in the big race. There's going to be an election for the president of the. There is an election. I should say, given the way we do things these days. There is an election now going on, and it will come to its final voting conclusion tomorrow across the country. And what I'm interested in is, uh, <laughs> okay, this is, the, this is uh, America after, right after Donald Trump won it. And so you can see uh, why he won it, which is uh, what's interesting about the last election was that the Democratic candidate, Hillary Clinton, actually received about 3 million more votes. But uh, Donald was able to, uh, Donald Trump was able to win because he uh, barely uh, won a number of states. And the way this electoral map works, or the way the electoral process works, is that uh, whoever is the winner of the plurality, whoever is the plurality winner, meaning the person with the most votes, and, and on the uh, presidential primaries in, in the states, generally it uh, takes, takes all of the electoral vote. Votes. And each state is allocated the electoral votes based on the size of their congressional delegations. So everybody gets two to start with, and then you get one for each congressman. Uh, that so most of the states and and the District of Columbia and the other besides the states, the District of Columbia gets three votes. So it's it's a there are 538 votes available. You need 270. There are two states who um, can allocate the votes, and that is Nebraska and Maine. So, you know, if you win in one of the congressional districts, you could end up with one of their votes. Anyway, looking at all of this, let's start off with a, a, an easy question. Well, the professor. Oh, no. Yeah. So tell me, you, you know, the, 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 I guess right now, well, first of all, tell me who's go going to win and then tell me, <laughs> tell me why Donald Trump didn't, what he would have to do to win. If, all if, right. If, yeah. Okay, let's go. I'll, I'll do my best. All right. Here, so here it is. So to win, Biden needs to win three of the states that Clinton barely lost last time. Uh, these are northern states, uh, industrial, former industrial states, um, heavily white, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. If Biden gets those three states, he wins the election. Um, and remember that Hillary barely won those, and that's what was so unexpected. This was the so-called blue wall that, that collapsed. Um, it created a crisis for the polling industry because although the national polls were, were pretty close, um, they really messed up these state-level polls, particularly in those states. So that's all Biden needs to do. But the thing is, Biden could lose one of those, and he could still win by picking up some of the other states in the Sun Belt. So those are the states like Arizona, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina that, that we're looking at. And, and he is leading in all of these states right now, um, depending on the poll. But um, you know, I think the, the most accurate poll of polls shows him with you know, either a really solid lead, like in Wisconsin, to... Uh, you know, kind of a very close uh, lead in Florida. Um, and then, you know, the state that's received the most attention recently is Pennsylvania, which was 
long time considered a solid democratic state, a good blue union state. Um, but those voters, these voters that form the core of, of, of Trump's support, the, the white voters without college degrees, there's a lot of them in Pennsylvania. I used to live in Pennsylvania. I, I, I know that for sure. And there, there's a lot of Trump support there. And so they've been putting a lot of money in Pennsylvania. And I think you know, that's going to be one state to watch, although we probably won't know Pennsylvania right away because they're going to be a little slow to count their votes. But if Trump. OK, let, let's say let, let's say Trump wins Pennsylvania. What else does he have to do to win the election tomorrow? Um, if Trump wins Pennsylvania, then he um, let's see, he would also have to win um, Florida. He needs to win Florida. He needs to win Georgia. He needs to win North Carolina. Um, he needs to win. Um, he needs to keep his states. He needs to keep his states. He, yeah. Um, and so there's not he doesn't have as many paths to victory um, as as Biden does. But if he if he does end up winning Pennsylvania, it's going to mean that these other states are probably going to trend in similar ways. Um, I don't think he's going to win Michigan, although if he wins Pennsylvania, that's that's possible. Um, so it's, I mean, he's only, um, so, so, so that's, I think that's the state to look at most closely because if Biden doesn't win Pennsylvania, then he can still win, um, but his paths to victory become a little more narrow. And it probably means that the polling has been off if he loses Pennsylvania, that these other states that look like Pennsylvania, which are these other Northern states like Michigan, it might, it might be off there too. What about you, Chad? Governor, I was hoping you were going to ask me about the Charter Amendment questions, but that's okay. We can talk. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to them. We'll come back to them. <laughs> no, no. I, I'm, I'm kidding. I mean, it really is. It's a cliche, but it really is the election of a lifetime. Um, and it's it's so unpredictable. But Colin's right on the numbers, although I would just add that some of those states are within the margin of error, and that includes Florida. And I don't know anybody that actually trusts the polling in Florida. Uh, given what happened 20 years ago or even more recently. But um, here's what I'm noticing is that there's a reason why Biden is spending so much time in Pennsylvania. One, it's close to Delaware, his home. Two, he was from Pennsylvania originally. It is the state that kills Trump. If he can't take Pennsylvania, it's going to be really, really hard to do that. And But Biden's also doing something else. He went to Iowa. I mean, <laughs> who would have thought... Right taking some time to go to Iowa. Kamala Harris went to Texas, a, another state that in theory is actually in play. Um, I believe Biden also went to Atlanta, uh, to Georgia, which is, which is another state. So those are states that were not blue four years ago. Trump, on the other hand, has to go back to the states that were not only red, but the ones that he barely lost, or barely won rather, the, the upper Northern states that Colin mentioned before, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, of course, and Wisconsin. So I think that's telltale. But look what Trump's doing. He's going to all those states. And right now, he's been flying five times a day. He's taken five different stops on Air Force One. And he's even talking about campaigning after election night, because that's when the, the next campaign starts, right? It's the legal challenge. So I think it doesn't look good for the president, but it is possible. Uh, but, you know, Chuck, I mean, how did you feel four years ago? Well, time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, three quick things to add. One, I think, I think uh, Biden has used Obama well to to go and get to, to make sure that nobody's taken for granted and that there is a there is a, 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 a real spirit to the campaign that really only only Obama can give it. Uh, that's been that's been good for the Democrats. That's number one. Number two, as we all know, uh, an election two uh, the election polls two weeks out and the election polls two days out are different polls every time they compress it just yeah. it shrinks and that it, John Way Hay certainly knows that sometimes he was on the wrong side of things and they compressed in his favor but but uh, that's what's happened now and and uh, and it's uh, made um, point three when I talk to my I guess you could say operative friends on the uh, on the mainland, strong Democrats who've been around for a while, there is not a one of them who feels confident at all about these poll numbers. They are very anxious people about what is going on and what could happen. So I don't think we can underscore the, the point that, that at this point, the polls be damned. 
it's about groundwork, field work, and who shows up, and and making sure all the votes are counted. And it it could it, you know I told somebody election night uh, four years ago, Chad, I think Hillary Hillary Clinton will win by a lot, or Trump will win by a little, and both things turned out to be true. <laughs> okay, we're going to take a short break right now, and we'll be back in a minute. So uh, we want to join uh, join you. Uh, pick up where Chuck just left off. Welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe'e and the political pundits of Hawaii Nei. Once again, we are prognosticating. And that's a fancy word for trying to uh, predict what is going to happen as a result of tomorrow. So we are talking about the presidential race, and I think all of us sort of reluctantly feel that um, the Democratic candidate ought to win, but knowing our president, our current president, nobody wants to say absolutely, you know, that he, that he, uh, that it'll be out that way. And one of the reasons is that um, one of the good things about all of this in the presidential race is that it's made a lot of the down ticket races on the continent and actually in Alaska as well uh, become much more competitive, which is something that didn't, you know, wasn't happening over the last few years. When I was uh, governor, we had out of the 50 states, we had 32 of them were Democrats. The number is a lot smaller now. So to begin with, it seems like the the blue side of the equation, um, at least on the statewide level, has been slipping in the last few years. And yet this election seems to offer an opportunity for the uh, Democrats to gain the majority back in the um, in the United States Senate. So. I'm going to go to you. Any, uh, Chad, any races that you particularly care about? Or? Well, I'm sure Colin and Chuck can add as well, but there's four that come to mind. Uh, Gardner and Hinkenlooper in Colorado. Gardner is the incumbent GOP. Hinkenlooper is going to win that race. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, and uh, McSally, Martha McSally and uh, Mark Kelly in Arizona. That one's closer, uh, but... Uh, I think that's McSally is in trouble, and this is the former astronaut and the, the husband of Gabby Giffords, of course, who was shot in that terrible tragedy. Uh, in South Carolina, who would have thunk it that Lindsey Graham could possibly be in trouble uh, against Jamie Harrison? Uh, I'm not completely confident that Graham's going to lose that, but with Lou Dobbs, of all people, denouncing... <laughs> Lindsey Graham, one of the president's closest allies, really a remarkable turn of events. You kind of see Trump just throwing the guy out, out uh, in the wind. Georgia with John Ossoff and, and Purdue, uh, the, uh, another race. And there's at least one or two, uh, I would think, Colin, maybe you could help me as well. But it is remarkable. Nobody forecast that the Senate was really going to be able to flip uh, some months ago. And it has really this would be, if Trump goes down, this is a, a textbook example 
of down ballot <laughs> going down with yeah. the, with the with the ship and and it's those races are really quite dynamic and I think it's very much a reflection uh, against President Trump. Well, I think you know, Susan, Co Susan Collins, Susan Collins yeah. in Maine is in good in, point in, in, in real good trouble point. and has. Has 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 danced the the jig and the horror and and uh, oh and wait the there's there's one more now that I think about it Cunningham and Tillis and right. North Cunningham Carolina. and Tillis Cunningham's yeah. the one who, who texted you know he's having yeah. an affair with a woman and then it goes up <laughs> by ten points or something and uh, so that <laughs> that's six yeah. races and Colin and my did, did you mention Arizona? Arizona did you get Arizona I did. I did. Uh, the, the, the only other one I would mention is that the Democrats are probably almost certainly going to lose a seat in Alabama with Alabama. Doug Jones and Tommy Tuberville. So right. they're going to they're going to lose. They're probably basically everyone's agreed they're going to swap Colorado and Alabama, Alabama, and they're going to have to fight out the others. Yeah. By the way, if 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 Doug Jones, who is really respected and liked in in the United States Senate by his Republican, uh, by excuse me, by his Democratic Peers and even by by some Republicans, but he's he's a he's a terrific guy. He's if 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 Biden wins, if Biden wins uh, the White House, and and Doug Jones loses, he's going to end up on that cabinet. That's a prediction. Oh, yeah, but the, the thing with Jones, of course, is he's running against a football coach, right? I mean, in Alabama, in, in Alabama, <laughs> you know, I mean, what do you what do you get for that, you know, and and and. Uh, well, what about uh, McConnell? Anything going to happen to him, or is there still a, still a long shot? I think it's a real long shot. I, I just don't see McConnell going down. Um, I don't either. It would really be remarkable. I think the, the he's running against a woman who I believe is a veteran, a combat veteran. Right. right. And in any other state or against any other politician would be... And pretty amazing, but I think Mitch knows Kentucky, yeah. Kentucky, right? <laughs> I hope I got it right, not Tennessee. Yes, Kentucky. Yeah. That's the, yeah, and but you know he's also looking at probably becoming the minority leader, or maybe maybe even losing that position to some uh, more ambitious person in the Senate because it's 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 going to be a big. I don't see McConnell losing, but it's he, you know he's he's a wily one that guy. You know, you never know what what uh, what will happen. What about you know? The strange thing about Georgia is you actually got two Senate races going on in Georgia, right? And there's one of the races uh, which people which they're saying uh, maybe a toss up at the moment, but um, also what up it, in Purdue, are you talking about? Yeah, Georgia well, no, the the one with the uh, with the Reverend. Uh, I'm trying to remember his name, Raphael Warnock. Warnock, because apparently there are two two Republicans and one Democrat running, or maybe another Democrat, and you you the two losers get thrown off until somebody gets fifty one percent. No, I, so, I think you have that right. Is it Kelly Loeffler? Is she the one that? Yeah, Kelly Loeffler Kelly and Loeffler. Doug and Doug Collins. Yeah, and Collins, of course, helped lead the House GOP defense against impeachment and and he's really got trump's support loffler was not the one that that um the president preferred to fill a senate seat she's had some troubles relinquishing her stock right before the stock market died and whatnot recently she denied knowing what happened on the hollywood access tape with president trump and you're right governor that goes into a runoff uh, and i and i believe the opponent again is another african-american yeah it's Raphael warnock yeah. Raphael Warnock, and that's going to be an interesting race. That'll re that race will go on for some time. You know, the what's interesting about all of these competitive states are, are the number of people who have voted early. Uh, you know, like the, in Georgia, it's almost over three and a half million people just already voted, you know, or more than that. And there's been a huge effort in Georgia. Um, backed by Stacey Abrams to register new voters, I think almost 800,000 new new voters. So it's been um, it's it's been massive. I mean, the number of new voters who are going to come into that Senate race. So I think that's what's making it harder to predict. But you're right, this special election where there's a bunch of candidates. That's the one that Warnock is in, who you know has tremendous authority in the community. He is the the senior pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church, the legendary church in Atlanta. So. 
Um, it, it's going to be tough for him, but he's 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 going to run a, a strong campaign in what I think is going to go to the runoff. Yeah. And if nothing think, else, all of this is diverting attention from, uh, or or is it from Trump's race? I, I I don't I have no idea. I don't think it, I don't think it's so much diverting it. And of course, the, this this cocktail of registration and the change and modification in election procedures to accommodate COVID, and also some of the changes that have been made in legislatures over over, over the last two years since the last election, is all a brew. That the president of the United States is 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 stirring right now with the idea of uh, uh, being able to challenge the results if he doesn't like them, and it will have to do with registration. It will have to do with when you know whether votes came in on time, uh, and and there are lawyers all over the place. They're ready to leap on this state by state. Uh, and they said there are four hundred lawsuits already uh, filed. So before wow. even the election is uh, come on, yeah, it's it's crazy. In 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 Texas, they they set up a system where you can, instead of getting out of your car and walking into a building and dropping ballots, you can do it from your car. And there is this lawsuit uh, to try and disqualify a hundred and twenty-seven thousand people. I believe with, I believe the lawsuit was just today. Dismissed. Yeah. It was coming oh, yeah. from Republicans, and I think it was particularly Harris County around Houston, which of course is a huge. Uh, and that's county. where the that's where the lawsuits are, are are being challenged. So it was that dismissed. That lawsuit was dismissed by a Republican judge appointed by George Bush. Well, and it was <laughs> it was also uh, it they filed before the uh, Texas Supreme Court, which is uh, was a Republican court, and they have disregarded it or dismissed but it goes before a federal judge appointed i believe by our current president on monday so the drama never ceases to uh end you know and right across the country i guess all of these voter suppression issues um Including the idea of, uh, well, one of the things the current uh, Trump, President Trump has done is that he's tried to stop the census, which is being done in part for reapportionment. And on the state level, the state house level, you, you're also seeing change or movement occurring. So I don't know. I've been, I've been directly involved with the census issue. And uh, bless the uh, United States Department of Census and the, the directors and the administrators within it have conducted a, a fair and appropriate census in what is a very difficult time. And uh, their numbers are good. What, what remains to be seen is on this issue of whether a non, uh, a, a, an immigrant, a non-resident immigrant, an illegal immigrant, non-resident immigrant, uh, can be included in the count or not. They are included in the census count. It will be the objective of the administration to pull those numbers out so those people aren't represented as, as, as people, even in states uh, that have to serve them and, and which they pay and which they pay taxes. So that's what's in front of us. And the, the ultimate decision there will affect what happens with reapportionment. But the basic census that's been conducted, I can tell you, has been uh, sound. And whether or not uh, uh, President and his Attorney General try to monkey around with it by discounting uh, aliens is, uh, you know, that, that remains to be seen. But that will go to court, uh, uh, the Supreme Court, I believe it's at the very end of November. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to follow up for a second and say that, you know, these, these other state house races, which you mentioned, um, I mean, People should remember that, of course, in a lot of these states, they control how you draw these redistricting lines. And there's a real chance. I know we talked about Texas before. There's a real chance this year that the Texas House, not the Senate, not the governor, could go to Democrats. And that would go a long way in redrawing those districts in a way that's a little more favorable to Democrats who've really had a lot of gains in Texas recently. All of those well-heeled suburbs around Houston, Dallas, and, and Austin have been 
going from traditional Republican seats to, uh, to Democrats winning it and holding those seats, it looks like. What do you think the majority of the uh, Latino votes are going to go? Uh, I'm assuming they're going to go Democrat, but it, it, is the Biden vote, the Biden uh, campaign going to receive the kind of support uh, that... Well, it's, uh, it's, it's wrong to talk about wrong, but it's 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 too, way too general to talk about a Latino vote, right? We all know that. They're, the Cuban vote will go mm -hmm. one way, probably Republican uh, in, in large measure. The Puerto Rican vote, on the other hand, after the way Puerto, Puerto Ricans in America and Puerto Rico, the way the way uh, the way Trump administration kind of handled the, the hurricane issue and the whole just the notion of admission of, of Puerto Rico as a state. We'll, we'll go another. And then there's the Mexican, Mexican American vote, which is probably a little bit more split. But my guess would be more Democrat than Republican. But Latino vote is like talking about the Hawaiian vote or the Jewish vote. I mean, who are these people anyway? They are a bunch of different kinds of diverse, wonderful. We, rich we, we, we have some in our right here. <laughs> but Governor, I, th I think you are on to something because, I mean, to Chuck's point, I agree. It's not a good idea to group everybody together and think just because they're going to, you know, that they're white or they're female or they're educated, they're going to vote this way or that. And yet that's what we do. That's what political scientists yeah. do. And the trend line, it's there. The data does reflect that broadly you can capture and make guesses on which way certain groups, demographics are going to vote. And when you bring up the Latino vote, I think the big question that has not been talked about much, and there are concerns in the Democratic Party that Biden has not reached out enough to this group because that group in many ways is open to conservatives, open to being appealing to uh, the Republican Party. And I, I, I think certainly I'm not going to disagree with Cuba and Miami and so forth, Cubans and Miami, but um, there hasn't been a big play and that vote is only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger uh, as uh, including in states like California, where it's almost the majority. So, uh, you know, it, uh, it seems like uh, I remember when the uh, basically the, the blue collar Catholic vote was an automatic, automatic Democratic vote. You, you couldn't get it any better than that. And that was most uh, a lot of Michigan, for example, were, were blue collar Catholics. And then all of a sudden, was ever since Ronald Reagan, the blue collar Catholics are starting to slip over uh, because of the abortion issue and other things uh, over same, in same sex in, marriage and other issues. Same sex marriage and also abortion slip over into the Republican vote. So it seems to me like what we call the Latino vote is cannot be taken for granted that because they're a minority they're automatically going to vote for the party that espouses a minority I, right. I completely agree. And actually, a lot of Biden support has come from these white voters who went over to Trump coming back home to the party, to Biden, who they, um, who they can relate to a little better. Um, you know, that explains his strength in, in the Midwest and in the Southwest with, with a lot of Latino voters. I mean, one of the most interesting statistics I've seen to come out of this race is you know, we often talk about the gender gap in politics and it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, right? We know that, that women, for the most part, really don't like Donald Trump. I mean, he's lost a lot of support among white women. But if you look at the Latino vote, what, that's one of the biggest gaps between the Latino women who are very opposed to Donald Trump to Latino men where he's barely losing them. I think maybe just, you know, under seven points are, are for Biden. So um, that's a huge gap. Um, and, and I think it goes, and I, I would agree with that criticism that he may not have reached out enough to those voters because he was so concerned um, about bringing these classic blue collar Catholic voters who he knows because he is one uh, back into uh, back into the fold. How much impact do you think the, the protest marches are going to have on this election? See, I think that's the sleeper card. And I think that the Republicans kind of knew that and in a way they wanted to pull a um a bush you know uh like they did with dukakis and so willie I saw, yeah the willie horton ads i saw a uh, ad in te on television here in hawaii just last night where you had the the picture of um 
you know, and it was an interesting ad because I, I wasn't sure what it was supposed to do, but it was Biden sponsoring the um, stricter laws to put, put people in jail. And it was being, and the pictures that were running uh, of those that were going to be put in jail were all uh, black men. And I was wondering, these guys, it's sort of real juxtaposition because on one hand, you have a president talking law and order, trying to be uh, a, do the Horton thing. And then on the other hand, trying to do the opposite by saying, I'm the guy you guys should vote for. And, you know, I'm with uh, Ice Cube and JC and all the rest of these guys. I, I'd like to say something about that. I, uh, there's no question why Trump is bringing up Antifa and saying Black Lives Matter is a, an evil organization and, and talking about the, the rampaging through the cities and so forth. The problem is, is it's not backed by reality. Uh, it's really, this is not Watts in the 1960s. This is not the Chicago Democratic Convention in 68. Um, it's, it's, they've been largely very, very peaceful. In fact, some of the protesters where it's gone violent have actually been conservative, the Proud Boys and, and, and whatnot. And, but it goes to that Willie Horton thing, the fear. All you have to do is strike the fear. And so that's why Trump talks about, I've saved your suburbs. I got rid of the low-income housing next to, you know. So I agree with you that he's making it a point. I don't know if it's completely connected. Well, and then he's also making the opposite point, at least his campaign is, and that is that Joe Biden's not the real, not a guy that you re that really wants to help you. He's the guy that put you in jail. He and Kamala Harris actually busted more black people than I ever did. You know, it's it's kind of interesting. I I, I I I don't know. Maybe it's a sign of desperation. Um, we don't have that many minutes left, but I I do know there's another subgroup in this election that's sort of interesting, and that has to, that's the Asian uh, Asian Americans and where they come out in all of this. Now, it seems like from what limited data I've seen that most Asian Americans who are, I guess, Americanized in a way, have become uh, uh, supporters of, uh, of Biden. But they are the the immigrant factor. Given I couldn't believe this, but I was recently up in Seattle talking to some people. Uh, who were Vietnamese, Cambodian, that 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 group, and they actually were yeah. real pro-Trump. I mean, they were Trump up, and, and and one of the things they liked the best about Trump, uh, well, there are two things they liked about Trump. Was the first was his stand against China. They, most of them, I realized, had sort of escaped from the Chinese influence. And he hasn't actually make a stand against China, but he talks about it. And the second, which was really interesting to me, was the wall. They seem to think that somehow having that wall, and of course, they were not at all in sympathy with the marches and so forth. It was so hard to picture all of this uh, coming together and whether it would I, be an I have some Vietnamese friends here at, in, in Honolulu, and... Uh, in a way, they, they are kind of true Republicans in the sense they've worked very hard for what they have. They work all the time. They're very pull yourself up from your bootstraps people and don't have much aloha for, for anyone who doesn't know what that's all about. So it's not really Trump Republicanism. It's, it's, it's the old time Republicanism of, you know, the best social program is a good job. They they adhere to that and. Uh, uh, and Are they voting for Trump, Trump though? Are they voting I think for they, Trump? I think I don't know who they're voting for, but my guess is, but but I think they are real Republicans. So I think they would would likely move that way on the basis that, as I say, they're they're self made people. They, yeah, yeah, they are definitely Republicans. I mean, that's the only group. Um, of Asian Americans that's majority Republican, the Vietnamese. And I think it's, it's a little bit like the Cubans, where this partly is a legacy right. of the Cold War, too. Right. I, I would just add, though, it, we tend to forget, I think if Biden wins this election, and all indications, most of them are that he will, we're actually going to have elected an African-American, Asian-American woman, yeah. the daughter yeah, right. of immigrants, the daughter of immigrants, 
to be vice president. And, and, and that is an extremely historic uh, occasion. And there is a sizable South Asian uh, population uh, in the United States. Uh, like the Latino group, Chuck, would you agree? The Asian group, you can't put them all together. There's just too many, yeah. just too many different backgrounds. But I agree with both Colin and Charles, Chuck, that they, they tend, a lot of them tend to be Republican. Well, okay, we only got a few more minutes left. And so to end this and end with my usual uh, finesse, I, I, <laughs> what, what, I, what I wanted to do today at the end, I um, saw a number of classmates from the Big Island that I went to high school with, uh, set aside a little, they started a little contest among themselves. And they're asking all of us to, um, uh, you know, to participate by guessing. And we're all supposed to submit this, guessing how many um, electoral votes we think that Donald Trump will get. See, and uh, of course, a number of them want zero and everything else. But they uh, and they they and and I sent you a piece of paper uh, earlier, and and that ex that paper was something I do did up for that contest. So I wanted to ask the the three of you. So just give me a number, you know, like, what do you think? Uh, I'm assuming all four of us hope, at least, that Biden will win, right? I mean, nobody's going to stand. But uh, at the same time, uh, how many, uh, uh, I would uh, suggest, how, what do you think Donald Trump's uh, electoral votes might be? Uh, who wants to go first? <laughs> I, I can go, I think, because I, I figured this out earlier, I, 203. Okay. I got one. All right, Chad. Well, let me just first say I, I am not officially endorsing Joe Biden. And or no, Biden. no, yeah, we, we, we're, we're As not. As a journalist, I'm being totally impartial. Um, I, um, I, you know, I'm, I, it's hard to give an exact number. I was watching Steve Kornacki on MSC last night. And he did 20 different scenarios of how the Electoral College could come out. <laughs> My understanding is that, you know, Trump has about a 10% chance. That's what Nate Silver is saying and others. But um, I do think it will be in the low 200s. And I think uh, Biden will be in the uh, low to mid 300s. Duck? Je ne sais pas. I don't really know. I didn't do, I didn't do numbers on this. I didn't see your email on it. Uh, I I I wouldn't I wouldn't at this point hazard a guess because I I don't I really haven't calculated it. Um, I think anything, but I do think um, I do think that unfortunately for me as a Democrat, I do think that Trump can win. Yeah, I do too. Uh, I, 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 but that's not the that's not the mood I wanted to end this show on. So so I'll give you my number. My number is one hundred ninety three. Mm. Mm. 193. Very bullish on Biden. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I figured I'm very bullish on seeing whether good things can still happen in the country. <laughs> but anyway, I want to thank you all for coming uh, and for participating. As usual, I've, in, I've enjoyed this. And I got you down for two, 203, 200 sort of, and 193. And Chuck, just give me a number. Uh, two, two, one, two. All right, guys. Thank you very much and uh, aloha. <laughs> <laughs>